autistic people with quality of life and opportunity. You're listening to the Autism CRC podcast. This is the Autism at Work speaker series featuring pre-recorded audio captured during the live Autism at Work virtual summit event held in March 2023. Hear from over 40 local and international speakers, panelists and presenters, including neurodivergent employees and employers, as they discuss the important topics affecting autistic people at work. You can also watch this series on the Autism CRC YouTube channel. And here we are once again. Hello, my friend. Great to see you again. I'm Orion Kelly, an autistic guy, YouTuber, podcaster, and someone who's just uh, very quickly cleared their browsing history because the federal police are here. <laughs> so it's a joke. It's a give up, take a breather. Good grief. Get a grip. Uh, all right. Now, welcome, my friends, to the first of uh, our two workshops we're running. At, uh, to start with, we're doing an Autism at Work program moderated by uh, Tim Collar from DXC. Before we get to Tim, I just want to give uh, you once again the Q&A rundown. Uh, we're going to try and answer as many questions as we can, and that will be in the capable hands of Tim. So let me throw over to our, our moderator for this particular workshop, Tim Colliver. All yours, Tim. Thanks very much, Ryan, and uh, good morning, everyone. Now, Marnie, which is a traditional Ghana greeting. So my name is Tim Colliver. I'm a business operations partner for DXC Technology. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of country that I'm on today, which is the Ghana people. I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge their continuing connection to land, water and community and would welcome my guests and all of you to, to do the same. This morning, we are talking about how to start out an art autism at work program. And I've got three amazing guests and I'll introduce them in alphabetical order based on their first name. So first we have uh, Lauren Rowell, who's a detective sergeant for the Australian Federal Police, as Orion mentioned. Uh, so Lauren is a detective sergeant. She served with the AFP for over 20 years and she's performed a range of policing and corporate roles within ACT community policing and national operations. Lauren is a mum for two amazing young boys and she's based in Canberra. And in early 2019, Lauren initiated the AFP's Neurodiversity Project to increase understanding of neurodiversity across the AFP, to create positive cultural change, and to enhance knowledge, support frameworks, and policy to better support and enable neurodivergent members in all aspects of their employment. Amongst other achievements and progress, Lauren was instrumental in the recent implementation of the DXC Dandelion Program for the AFP. And Lauren is passionate about helping people enhancing technical and operation capability, raising awareness and positivity for this project. And she's, she's determined to maintain momentum on this important work and to see progress made that benefits all AFP employees, both now and into the future. So please make her welcome in just a moment. Secondly, we have Stacey Kupka, who's a Director of Organisational Strategy at Department of the Treasury. Stacey is the Acting Director of the Organisational Strategy. She leads the design, development and implementation of workforce strategies, policies, programs and initiatives, specialising in workforce planning and inclusion and diversity. Stacey is a qualified human resources practitioner with over 18 years of applied experience across both the private and public sectors. Stacey has led the development and implementation of several inclusion and diversity strategies, strategies throughout her career guiding the diversity and inclusion agenda across these organizations. She's contributed to significant workforce reform programs and is passionate about affecting strategies that improve and deliver outcomes for both the organization and employees. And lastly, but not leastly, Vicky Booth. Vicky has been proudly working in education for over 25 years. And as the director of the Queensland Department of Education's Autism Hub, Vicky's current role provides leadership and influences the development of inclusive school culture for students with autism. The Autism Hub has a broad scope across the state, independent and Catholic schools throughout Queensland, supporting young people with autism, their educators and families from zero all the way through to 18 years of age, with a focus on preparing every student for their future and support positive transitions from school into their next steps into further education and employment. So please give them all a, a warm welcome from home. I'm sure we can feel the positive vibes from there and I welcome them to uh, jump on now. Please say hello. Lauren, please we'll start with you. Can you say how, did, how is it that you came to be an ally for the neurodivergent community? Wow, how did I become an ally? I guess it started um, 
from my childhood, to be honest. I have family members that are neurodivergent, um, some with autism, some with ADHD. So I was sort of aware of what that was like uh, and seeing other people in their lives. And then it became quite apparent uh, in my career, um, working with people who would be neurodivergent, but I saw um, the culture wasn't ready for them to say that they were neurodivergent. So I thought, why not change that? Um, so I guess that's where it started. Um, just with that personal connection, seeing people's journeys um, and wanting to, people to be able to be themselves. Um, yeah, so I was going to be that change. Family is a, is a powerful reason and very much the same for me as well. Stacey? Hi, firstly, I would like to say I'm joining you from Ngunnawal country and I'd like to pay my respects to elders past and present and emerging and extend that acknowledgement to First Nations people joining us. Um, I guess for me, I've always been an advocate for treating people as individuals um, I believe that everyone comes from a different background and brings different strengths and comes from a different point of view and brings that value to the workplace and to the community. Um, it was probably when I was in an, another agency, I started working in the area of inclusion and diversity that I really understood the barriers people face to employment. Um, so now I'm leading a team at Treasury where I feel I can really make that difference and give those opportunities to people. Thanks, Stacey and Vicky. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. I'm coming to you from Mianjin in here in Brisbane, in very sunny Brisbane today. Um, I um, have had a, a really a personal and a professional connection to this work for a long time. I'm also the mum, very proudly the mum of a beautiful young man with a diagnosis of autism who has just finished school and has started to uh, navigate that journey into the world of work. Um, but for many years across my career, I've been working in the area of disability and inclusion. And certainly here in Queensland, I'm really proud to be uh, director in the Disability Inclusion and Student Services branch here in Queensland, as you heard in the, in the introduction. Um, I think for us, this has been um, a really important part of our work in ensuring that the inclusive practices and the opportunities and potential of our children with autism in schools here in Queensland has a, a positive trajectory in fact that we're not just um, preparing them for the world of work, but preparing work for them and their wonderful strengths. And so for us as, as the government, um, we knew that we should be leading the way in ensuring that we had a really robust neurodiversity employment program. And so the Autism Hub um, has certainly been a real leader in that initiative. And uh, we have very much uh, enjoyed um, being able to uh, take others on our journey and learn from it. So uh, yeah, that's that's how we got him started. <laughs> yeah, thank you. My, my personal story is, is from 2016 when I started becoming engaged with the DXC Dandelion program that was then fairly, fairly early on and hearing those stories and seeing those people joining the workforce for the first time and understanding the barriers they had overcome to get there. You know, it, it melts a certain part of your heart. And we, we heard those in the, in the workshop yesterday with the, those direct employees who were experiencing things for the first time at, at work. And it was amazing achievement that they've had. So I think our, our next point is, is around the autism at work, right? really jumping into it. These things take a while to get off the ground. And all of you have been on a, a personal journey of pushing that and pushing that all the way through. So when did that start for you, Lauren? When did you start to try and say, let's get a program at work going? Um, yeah, so it started in 2019 and it was right before COVID. I went to a International Women's Day convention and um, there was a, a lady there talking about neurodiversity and women in drone technology. And the word neurodiversity just resonated with me. And I sort of didn't actually know that meant neurodivergent, ADHD, autism, dyslexia. I didn't know what that was. So I did a bit of Google research and um, then I, I guess I just reflected on that's the stuff that actually interests me and I really want to see change. Um, so I went back to work and my boss had made the mistake of telling me to find my passion. So she went away for four weeks. And when she came back, I had written a 48 page paper on neurodiversity and the challenges um, within AFP in the cultural space. And then a business case on the opportunities if we start working in this area. Um, so she was a bit gobsmacked, I think, but that started it. Um, but then COVID hit which was, a, um, I guess, put everything on the back burner. And, and as the AFP, we had a lot of other priorities at that time. Um, so I guess it started there, but I just let that simmer away. Um, and being who I am, I like to talk a lot. So I pretty much started ringing people and saying, hey, do you know about this awesome neurodiversity thing? And they'd say no. And so I would tell them and I would share my paper. 
which funnily enough, I never finished because I didn't need to, but um, just started leveraging the stakeholders. Um, over time, I developed uh, presentations, which I started delivering on a basic intro to neurodiversity. And then, um, uh, look, there's so much, um, we wouldn't have time for me to step by step through it, but essentially that's where it started and it's just gained momentum and I'm still going with it. It's a long journey. And I imagine in, inside 48 pages, there's a lot of market <laughs> research, you know, what is this? Why is this? What is the problem? I like that it was specific to AFP to say, yeah, this is, this yeah, is us think, and this is who we are yeah. and what we need. Yeah, I went beyond just the social contract of, you know, it's nice, it's diversity and inclusion. But um, I guess looking at what the AFP does, we have a, a very broad remit. We're both in Australia, we do community policing functions, national operations, international. There's a whole lot of stuff that we actually perform. So I looked at the business need and I think that that was where I was able to sell it in terms of capability uplift, um, you know, like a lot of other businesses competing in tight markets for talent um, and was able to craft um, this 48 pages around, this is the good thing we should be doing to represent the community which we serve, but it also serves our mission, um, which is that serving the community. But we also have that, it's gonna help us financially in our productivity and our efficiency. So it's a nice thing to do, but it's actually gonna really help us be cutting edge. Um, and I think that the dual approach, two pronged approach, um, really has been quite successful and it's all true. It's all very common sense um, and it's just a win-win for everybody. So it's not a hard sell. Yeah. So 2019 for you and 48 pages. When, when was yours, Stacey? Um, mine was probably a little bit more of a simpler journey. Um, I, I started with Treasury about uh, 12 months ago, um, actually a little bit longer than that. And one of my first tasks was to develop our new inclusion and diversity strategy. So as part of that, we did um, a numerous um, focus, focus groups with our employees. In these focus groups, we were hearing from our employees um, and their experiences about being neurodiverse in the workplace. So we actually have quite a number of people, we don't know the number, but we have quite a number of people who self-identify as neurodiverse or find out that they were a neurodiverse once they had started with us, um, which was another interesting story. So this, the topic or the, um, we started looking at neurodiversity um, as sort of uh, part of a pillar of inclusion and diversity. Um, and this created a lot of interest because we were hearing these stories. Um, I also have been really fortunate to have senior leadership who are already aware of some of the programs that have been happening across the public service. And we're really interested in bringing that to our agency. So I already had that senior leadership support for it. I didn't need to build a huge um, case for it. Um, we were, it was more like, how do we make this happen? Where can we do this? Um, so yeah, we probably took the approach of, um, yeah, I we have a high, um, a big IT presence um, in our workforce. So that might be an area that we can um, introduce a program and see how, what we can learn from it. Um, and yeah, that's probably my story. Well, I think that what I just heard there is absolutely to be applauded that your organization has already a very high threshold of cultural safety in the sense of people being willing to self-identify knowing that that can be celebrated within there. So that's awesome to hear. How about you, Vicky? What a fabulous stories from Lauren and Stacey. Actually, I could just sit and wait, listen to you guys <laughs> this morning on this session, uh, but I'll try and contribute in some way. Um, I think uh, for us, ours is a little bit the same as you, Lauren, actually. About 2019, um, we had some probably broader conversations in um, the Queensland Government around a neurodiversity employment target for the whole of government initiative. And considering that in education at the Autism Hub, one of our um, you know, real imperatives is to ensure that we are preparing young people um, in those senior phases of learning for employment and, and better futures. And we knew that the data wasn't particularly on our side. And so there was a, it was a real um, need for us to ensure that not only were we preparing our children, but also preparing employers and ourselves for what that looked like. So I guess there was a bit of a moral imperative. We knew that there was a problem and we knew that we needed to be part of the solution. And so that was very much a cross uh, government initiative that the Department of Education were happy to take the lead on. And so in 2019, we started the All Kinds of Minds pilot program and neurodiversity employment program here at the Department of Education. 
a little bit like you, Stacey, we, um, we did a diversity survey that encouraged people to tell us a little bit more about the diverse needs that they had as employees of the Department of Education. And that certainly helped us to, um, to create that safe space you were talking about, Tim, around what it would look like for um, employees who currently worked for the department to be well, better supported and to have more understanding in their teammate, with their teamwork around what it looked like to work for us. But also we wanted to ensure that we um, started a recruitment that allowed uh, neurodiverse young people, particularly out of school we were preferencing, um, to start their, their journey of employment with, um, uh, with the department. And so through that, we, um, we did some wonderful work with uh, having watched DXC and the Dandelion Program, Lauren, um, and learning a little bit about what that would look like. And we partnered with organisations um, like Untapped to help us actually to develop some structures around not only the recruitment of young people, but also the support of young people, the support of their teams around mentoring um, and a whole host of different online communities that in uh, what four years later have absolutely taken off. Um, and uh, it's been a very exciting and successful program, which we're really proud of and certainly um, can help to continue into the future. Thanks, Vicky. Some, something you said, Stacey, I'm just reflecting on is that element of being data-driven in the way this has gone through. And all of you have mentioned that you've laid your hands on stats and, and details of how to put this forward to as a business case. And it's something that DXC internally is very, very conscious of. This is not a charity thing that we do. Autistic people, neurodivergent people do not need charity. They need equity to support them at achieving the things that they want to achieve because we're all entitled to have a really good life to do the best we can and with the amazing skills that we have. How did you go about laying your hands on some of the data that you needed to support 48 pages, Lauren, or less in, in the cases of others? Where did you get that from? Um, probably something I neglected to mention was that our um, new commissioner, he's not new now, but Commissioner Kershaw um, established an innovation fund for the AFP to allow um, yeah, uh, staff to come up with innovative ideas and, and pitch for funding. So um, I submitted for the neurodiversity project and my idea was we would run a survey because as all good detectives do, we all believe in evidence and evidence-based decision-making. And I do love numbers. Numbers do support your business case. So I um, partnered with Aspect Research in 2020 and we designed and delivered um, a scientific survey essentially, um, which gave us some amazing metrics. Um, just off the top of my head, we had 17.4% of the workforce representing some form of neurodivergence, whether diagnosed or self-identified. We had 2% um, diagnosed with autism, 5% uh, dyslexia, and I think it was either five or 10% ADHD. Um, and we also looked at the attitudes um, towards it within the staff towards those different um, conditions. And so that's that's how I went and got some metrics. And, and since then, those numbers have actually informed a lot of um, changes in the way we do things within the organisation. So we have a brand new diversity inclusion strategy, which has actually removed the pillars. And I think that that's probably based off the intersectionality that we've been able to demonstrate, especially in that neurodivergent space. Um, and I really love that they've done that because you can sit across multiple pillars. You, you aren't defined by one pillar. Um, but anyway, that's, that's how I got those numbers. And since then, established um, a bit of an ERG. It's, it's in forming stage, but we've got about 85 members now who have joined that, which is sensational. And it's only going to grow. Um, so I'll just get the numbers from them now and hear their stories. Awesome. And there was a great session on ERGs earlier in, in the workshop, so please jump into that one. Just as a clarification question, I think you used the word diagnosed a few times in terms of ADHD and neurodivergency. Yep. Is, is di self-diagnosis something that you accepted within AFP? Uh, so the way we ran the survey was that we wanted to differentiate uh, for autism because that was going to be our, our primary um, starting point because you have to start somewhere and we wanted to start um, focusing on, on that to separate that one out particularly because we then also ran a um, part of the survey was on autistic traits and we had one in four rate highly for autistic traits. So we wanted to separate that out from the diagnosis so we could demonstrate to the workforce that you might not have a diagnosis, but you actually might have some of those traits and trying to encourage people to have that uh, self-reflection um, in their own um, way they interact. Um, so we're trying to separate those two out, but for ADHD and dyslexia, we allowed for either. And I know that that can be a polarizing question about whether you include self-diagnosis and diagnosis together, um, 
but for where we're at right now, we I see that they, if somebody wants to self-diagnose and be in that boat and we need something, we should be providing that regardless. The, the trait based you just, you just mentioned there, I think is an incredible insight. So thank you. Uh, yeah. Stacey or Vicky? Um, I think for us, uh, I know I mentioned data, but ours was actually more that qualitative data. It was the, this word being thrown around that people weren't familiar with, this neurodiversity or neurodiverse or autism, autism and um, people, you know, self like, like saying I'm neurodiverse and I need some help or I need this little adjustment in the workplace. And we had um, their supervisors going, I've never heard of this. How do I assist? Um, so for us, it's the education piece, but in regards to the data, like this year in our employee survey is actually the first time we're actually going to collect quant uh, quantitative data around neurodiversity. And we're using a very simple question, do you identify as neurodivergent? Um, and not putting a description around that um, so that we can get a sense, a more of a sense of how many people in our workforce are neuro or identify as neurodivergent and whether they're diagnosed or not. Um, and coming back to the pillars question, yeah, our IND strategy, um, we, would, we were trying to move away from the pillars, but we acknowledge that we also need to address where there are those barriers. And the topic, when we were talking about neurodiverse, it's a spectrum and some people need more assistance than others. So there was a lot of talk about how do we represent neurodiverse people in our strategy. Um, so that was, um, yeah, part of that. The spectrum, how do you identify? Is it diagnosis? Is it not? Do you need a lot of adjustments? Do you not? Yeah, so... Um, we um, haven't dived into that quantitative or so specific data yet. Um, we're very at that early stages of understanding neurodiversity in the workplace. And it reminds you of Ayers Rock, doesn't it? Or Willaroo, I should say. You know, we, we see a big lump on the top, but what, what we don't see is the huge, huge volume underneath of those who might be suppressing or accommodating or, or doing whatever they need to do to try and get by in the organisation. But hmm. as we talking with Lauren earlier this week, the rising tide lifts all boats. The commitment to equity in the organisation makes it makes a difference for everyone. Vicky, was there anything you wanted to add in terms of data collection and, and being data driven? Um, well, I guess for us, it might be a little bit different. I don't know if it's useful for, uh, for workplaces to know, but uh, we have uh, what we call a year 13 survey data that tells us about the where our young people who've graduated from school the previous year have gone um, in the next year. And so we're often able to, we are able to disaggregate that data to let us know uh, which of those young people were young people who were neurodiverse or young people with autism. And so that has led us to have broader conversations about our responsibilities um, as a Department of Education in following and, and preparing those young people for successful futures outside of school. So when we looked at that data and we, and we started to really take accountability for how we were doing our job, um, in following up that data, then that sort of led us to have a very strong um, argument as to why we needed to ensure that we were helping workplaces to um, be more prepared um, to ensure that uh, young people were supported in employment. Thanks, Vicky. I think the next uh, sort of sub-question in relation to this is, is about when you found the opportunity to, to strike. So having sort of built your data up, built your business case, what was the opportunity you saw within the organisation to say, now's my time. Now I need to speak to this, this person, this, this role, this leadership role, and get this going. What, what triggered an autism at work kickoff? That's a very good question, isn't it? <laughs> it's probably not an easy one, to be honest, because there's so many moving parts. Um, so for me, I, I took the opportunities anytime I saw them. Um, I made opportunities by reaching out to the key stakeholders. So uh, we also have a, a new internal medical model for policing called SHIELD, which is uh, a decentralised model for health for, for our policing members. And so I've been engaging heavily with them because we have mental health social workers, psychologists and um, that sort of medical model. So I've been working with them to understand how we can work together because I do. this is all about working together. So um, providing um, 
I guess, a, a consultation role in that space. So that was, that's a very slow burn. Um, but the, the biggest ticket and the biggest strike for us, other than providing presentations to different teams that are asking for it and partnering with our All Abilities Network, which is one of our committees. Um, so I now sit on that committee. Um, I guess the biggest one was when one of our tech areas rang me and said, oh, hey, Lauren, that presentation you gave us three years ago about uh, neurodiversity, you, the, you had a program and um, there was a few that we spoke about, but the one that, that really, I guess, ticked the bucket list for them was the Dandelion program. They had a, need, a business need. Um, they loved the idea. Um, so that was the key opportunity for us to, to go out and, and look at all of the different options. And then ultimately the business chose the Dandelion program, which suits their needs. And that's um, happening right now as we speak and should go live in June. Um, and that's really been a and hopefully will continue to be a big catalyst for the change needed. I, I think um, for people listening could understand that being in an operational policing organisation that, you know, the culture is in, um, has like a history to it. It's not always easy to get in and change. And there's a lot of mindsets around the work that we do. So I think them seeing this program come in and it'll boost our capabilities. It will bring in education. It'll bring in what I'm hoping is that that cultural change that's really needed. And everyone I speak to, especially our senior executive of nothing but supportive of the whole concept. And they're always asking me, what can we do to support this work, to get this out there? And um, I've been presenting to the entire agency. I'm, you know, obviously provided permissions to come and speak um, openly um, here today. Um, so it's just every opportunity when I can get it, just keep talking about it. And for you particularly, that was the opportunity to launch at scale. So a lot of our dandelion pods, they launch with up to 12 people. They can certainly be smaller and, and in some cases we're doing twos and threes, but that chance for you to jump in at scale and then have a demonstrable success and go, this is amazing, let's do it again. That was a, a great opportunity. Was it similar for you, Stacey? Um, we probably have a much smaller workforce, so our scale was much smaller. And I think for us, yes, we we had that support to let's, see what we can do in this space and for us we had to find where the best place to support a program such as the Denny Lane program um, would be and that was in our IT branches um, so that's where we were able to identify what program we were going for is where we would be able to and, and for us we're in those very early days so it's a bit of a pilot program before we bring it broader across um, our workforce and yeah so that need for talent in IT and those skills was one of the drivers that was the catalyst of putting that program or looking at a program in our IT area um, and yeah we have a, a much smaller scale hopefully we can <laughs> expand in the future but as I said our, in the ratio of our workforce we're a much smaller workforce so um, yeah for us there was the support, but it was just finding the right time and just we just grabbed the opportunity. We didn't wait um, <laughs> to implement. We're like, let's get this ball rolling from day one. <laughs> that a, was life sort of, changed. Uh, a life change is a life change. It's an amazing thing. Yeah. Vicky? Yeah, what great stories. Oh, really, I just love listening to Lauren and Stacey. Um, but I will tell a little bit about what we, what our journey was actually, in that I guess uh, for us, a little bit like both of you, I imagine there was lots of paperwork, there's lots of briefings, and there was certainly lots of different way, things that we had to navigate to ensure that this was successful. But I think what I'm hearing from both Stacey and Lauren is actually that it was um, it was really that leadership that allowed the opening of doors to for these programs to blossom and, and take hold in our organisations. And certainly at the time, we had an, a very, uh, in 2019, we had a very uh, receptive uh, Director General, Deputy Director General and Assistant Director General who were all on board. At the time, the Department of Education were um, rolling out uh, and embedding an inclusive education policy. And so this was really part of ensuring that not only were we looking after schools, but we were also looking after the corporate part of schools in ensuring that we had um, an inclusive culture right across the department. So the timing was right for us. Uh, we were really, um, I love what you said before, Tim, about the fact that this isn't a charity. We were really sure that uh, the um, employment uh, holes that we had in the department, it's always hard to get staff, uh, were actually open to all 
uh, and not a select few. And both Stacey and Laura will understand that when you're applying for positions within the government organisation, there are lots of hoops you have to run through and you need to know all sorts of different technologies, et cetera. So it was very hard uh, for some people to break those barriers down. We asked everyone across our um, education branches and communities to um, offer um, any open uh, um, employment opportunities that they had, so any positions that were available, and that we would, through our HR department, set up a recruitment that perhaps could fill them for them. Everyone loves that because um, HR is a really hard thing to do, uh, and it's, it's a really hard thing to do when you're a very busy director or an executive director. And so being able to fill those permanent positions uh, quite genuinely right across our department in all different fields was something that um, enabled us to really harness the strengths of young people coming out of schools who perhaps wanted to come and work within the government or perhaps in the first few years of work, perhaps had been at university and were looking for employment. So um, for us, it was about having leadership that allowed us to um, use the opportunity of an inclusive culture that was changing here in the department and, and really find employment that was sustainable and long-term for all of those wonderful young people who now are a part of our team. That's an awesome point. I definitely want to segue from that one, Vicky, which is all of you have at some point mentioned leadership and the executives within your departments or organisations that have enabled this to go ahead. And there's been a great question in, in the, the chat as well, and please continue with those, about handling pushback, handling someone that says no, too hard, too weird, I don't understand it. Can, can I give you a two part question in terms of how high does it need to go to succeed? And how did that help you to handle anyone that was resistive to that change? The question on how, I guess, how high you need to go really depends on the structure of your agency and, and your mission and your objectives and who's who's going to be at that right level. Um, I've been extremely lucky that my project champion was also our All Abilities Network champion, who's at the national manager level. Um, he's just the most amazing human being you could ever meet. I don't know if he's listening today, but um, he's been one of the reasons that this has been successful because he saw the opportunity. He's a great human. He saw that we have staff who are neurodivergent. We, we also want to bring more staff in for those technical gaps. He saw that opportunity and national manager level, I guess, is one of the topper rungs, if so quite quite high up. I mean, obviously the commissioner is, is the top um, and he showed interest by funding my innovation project. So I felt like I've, I had a lot of um, support at that highest level. So I think it's got to be high enough that they've got enough influence. Um, but they also need that personal connection, I think, because that really, that buy-in, they need to see the value. So in terms of the second part in pushback, um, I've only had it a couple of times and it's generally come down to education and the fact that the people pushing back have no personal experience. They actually don't know what you're asking for and it sounds hard. And once you, I think if you sit with them, um, and I've done that and explained what neurodiversity is, what autism really is, what ADHD really is, not what the media says it is. Um, although I think the good doctor's done a lot for autism. You know, I think just explaining what it is, and it's not that hard. If you really understand it, we provide them with a bit of knowledge, um, some how, how, we, how this might look. You can really change minds. And I do that one-on-one -on -one every time I get the opportunity. Um, and for the ones that have pushed back, um, I have managed to change the thinking. Um, and, you know, introducing them to somebody that we have within the AFP who might have a, um, who might be happy to talk to them about their experiences and just having that relationships really, really helped um, to leverage that support. Um, I don't know if that completely answers the question, but I just think it's important it is, that whoever it is, yeah, understands you need to change the environment to fit the person, not change the person to fit the environment and to remove the stigma and the prejudice. Um, ultimately, it's not wrong. It's not right anyway. So education. And as we've seen, you're a very persuasive person. So I think you've, you've done a lot there. Was, was that just to clarify in that last point, was that a neurodivergent person that you actually asked to advocate to, to did, one of those yes. challenges? Um, yeah. Because we have to recognise that we employ neurodivergent people already. I think that's really important that those in um, for, for my generation where diagnoses weren't happening when you were a child, uh, we've got years of uh, masking and baggage to unpack. So I think for an agency like ours that's 40 years old, you've got to know that most of your workforce probably have been fitting in for their whole lives. And that's part of what we need to educate people on is so they can unmask and put that energy into their work and not in pretending to fit in and, and being overwhelmed and keeping it internally. So I did manage to convince somebody 
who's become quite a, a wonderful advocate who's who's you know not had an amazing time to be honest but I think that's where we need to accept that this has been the reality to today and we draw that line and how can we improve so that that's not the journey of the next lot that are coming in that you know Vicky's supporting mm. to go from that education setting into the employment setting really setting up the environment for them and having the right managers at all levels and the right people within the organization to create those career pathways for the future. Yeah, yeah. for okay. us as well is yes, we we had, you know, support from the very top. Our agency head is a big supporter of inclusion and diversity. Our senior sponsor is our champion for access and inclusion. But where the real impact or the real um advocacy or support came from is that managers supervisors and the colleagues where our employees actually work and it, there was a bit of fear there and it is about that education of this is just treat them like another <laughs> person with needs and um, like you would treat anyone else um, but also you know providing that education and providing that support to those areas so they felt comfortable um, in providing these opportunities and that's where we really gained the ground the senior leadership support was great but it's on that ground on the ground in the the units the employees are working in is where the support needs to be thank you there was one thing I wanted to, to throw into there as well asking a neurodivergent person to champion is, is something is probably you want to do fairly rarely that we obviously are aware of cultural burden of of anyone whether they be different for some reason having to regularly stand up and say, oh, I'm the designated person to speak on behalf of autistic individuals in the workplace. So it's an awful thing for anyone to have to, to carry. So it's something we do with great care. But over to you, Vicky. Thanks, Tim. I think um, for us, we, uh, we were really looking for early adopters who were already on board with us. So we knew that there was going to be pushback, but we also knew that there were a lot of people who were really keen to come along with us on the journey. And so we embraced those people very quickly and made sure that we um, gave them an enormous amount of support and allowed them to be vulnerable and honest about the challenges that were um, coming up as managers and as employees, um, as teams who were working um, uh, all together, we wanted to make sure that there were different levels of support uh, that allowed the success of the program to really shine through. And we found that by harnessing those early adopters, we then made them really our communications team. Um, and they were able to share as managers what it was like for them, the support that they had been provided through the online communities, the podcasts we ran, the mentoring programs that, um, that we um, put together. Um, and that allowed them to be very honest. And I think the vulnerability of that was, was important. Um, for some people, they were really worried about what it was going to look like or the adjustments they would have to make or could these people do this job? Um, and so it was, it was an important conversation to have and we needed to be open to it and we needed to allow them to ask lots of questions. Um, and we didn't always have the answers, but it was, it was successful enough that, that we then had a team of people who could then help others to um, understand a little bit more about the program. And, and that was very helpful. And that's, yeah. uh, sorry, Tim, <laughs> take over the conversation here. No, too. please go. Um, so our, our uh, employees have been with us for about two months now, and we have not communicated about the Dandelion program yet. We have not highlighted our employees. We want them to feel as part of um, our workforce as much as possible. So. Um, we, we will do that promotion down the track, but yeah, coming to that point of having those um, neurodiverse people as spotlighting and being advocates for themselves, we want to feel, them to feel as part of the workforce as well. So, um, yeah. Um, yeah, there was, there was a comment I got from a DCA event yesterday, sorry, while I was moonlighting, which was about ERGs. And there's a, a tendency in our ERGs to... Take, take hold of particular days, whether that be a National Reconciliation Week or an Autism Awareness Day, and to pick that day and say, aren't we, aren't we awesome, here's what we're doing. But there's also a great opportunity to say, here's the business outcome of what we're doing. Here's what we've achieved for the business, which I think gets back to what you just said, Stacey, of communicating something that is business value as opposed to what could be considered a, a tokenism. But there's, yeah. there's a great uh, comment in the chat or question about non-IT roles 
So we, we talk a lot about IT, DXC is very IT, although we do have business process work as well. Are there roles that you've had identified in your organisation for neurodivergent people that are not IT? Um, those who have actually come forward as neurodivergent are not in IT roles in our, in our workforce. So we do have those roles just with the program. That's where we identified um, we might see how the program runs and what we can learn from it. But yeah, definitely, as I said, we would like to expand the program to other areas in our workforce. Should I go next? <laughs> go for it. Um, so I'm going to say almost the same. Um, so we, I think that neurodivergent people can do anything. Uh, it just depends on their skills and their talents and what they want to do. Um, I think, yeah, there's a job out there for everyone. And uh, similarly to Stacey, the reason that Dandelion Pod's going into a technical area is because we had the business need and the skills and talents just happen to um, suit the, the very technical nature of what we're asking them to do. Um, and... Um, we want to enhance that capability and, and keep them in those roles because we do compete with industry. So I think um, we're not going to simply say that that's the only thing they can do because that is tokenism and it's also untrue. There are many autistic people who go, I don't like IT. Um, no, turn it off. You know, I'm not interested. But um, that's, that's the, right. AFP, yeah, yeah, yeah. the AFP just does so much. There's so much opportunity. I see opportunities for use cases everywhere. Um, so it's just world's their oyster in my view. We just have to create that right environment with the training, the right attitudes, the right supports, um, and yeah, go nuts. Open the door, lay out the welcome mat, Absolutely. enable the yeah. accommodation that already anybody here. needs. That's the thing. Yeah, it's they're already here, and it's just it's just being able to allow that to be, um, as Stacey said, just they're just part of the business. They're just another a person that just has different needs to somebody else. Um, yeah. I think they're some of the most amazing people I've ever met. <laughs> I tend to like them a lot. So, yeah, which is awesome. Yeah, and I think we're similar here in the um, in Queensland in that we've we've had a very broad range of roles that have become available. Um, and, of course, you know, um, there's not identified roles that, that, uh, that we put through our HR team, but any role that comes up in the department right across all of the branches um, is certainly something that would be available. So definitely not just focused on IT, yeah. Okay, uh, next question is around your diversity, equity and inclusion strategies. How much did you find that you relied on an existing policy that was in place or how much were you changing it as you launched your program and as a result of your program? Good question. Um, so we've just got a new diversity inclusion strategy that I mentioned before, which removed the pillars that we had before. So I guess initially um, I read our previous strategy and there wasn't a pillar for neurodiversity and I could see that, you know, we have disability, which is where I I assumed that they thought they would sit, but not but not all neurodivergent people identify as having a, a disability. They just see it as a difference. So I wanted to put in another pillar, um, but worked with, with the Human Rights Commission to re reimagine our new strategy. I'm really happy with it. So um, I guess I, I personally don't, I think strategies are wonderful, um, but I want to see it in action. I don't want it to just be this document that hangs out there that we all go, oh, that's really lovely, but we're not actually implementing it. So I suppose I will use it to the point of holding people to account if I ever needed to, but I'm very lucky that I haven't needed to because the areas actually are doing a lot of this stuff anyway. Um, we are very much around inclusivity in the AFP. We, we do have a diverse workforce and we recognise that. We do celebrate certain days, um, which is interesting because there's, there's so many, um, but we do, I think we do the best we can. So I, I don't, yeah, mm. I don't think it's important to have one, but I think it's more important that we're doing something. And, and we're, we're the same, like um, our strategy hasn't been officially released yet, but we've already done the work under the strategy. We're already moving along with the actions. So it is around the actions. The strategy is great. It, um, you know, gives us a direction of we want to be more inclusive and diverse. Um, I'm also trying to move away from the pillars, but uh, we've got a bit of a maturity journey to happen there. But um, yeah, we it's around all those, addressing all those barriers and all the, the actions underneath to make us a more inclusive and a, a, a culturally safe um, workplace. I'll just caveat, I don't mean to say that having the pillars is bad, just put that out there that we haven't but I think um yeah just wanted to say yeah that. but but it does come to that it's a growth reality yeah. and it comes as I keep saying it's about the in individual no matter what their background um they come with different strengths they come with different points of view it could be a 
different educational background. It could be a, a different lived experience growing up. It, it <laughs> you know, there is you could have a thousand pillars, but really it comes yeah. down to um, yeah, making uh, the environment inclusive and addressing the individual needs. I'd like to see there be a catchphrase one day for neurodiversity or any kind of diversity that different is normal. I just think that's <laughs> great because I don't know anyone. I've never met anyone exactly like me. So, yeah, I think different is normal. I want to get that out there. Put it on T-shirts. <laughs> I, think, I think there's been <laughs> comments throughout the conference about the, the, the end goal is individuality. We're just, we're just hitting the biggest gaps that we can find in, in order and in, in accordance to it with our preference. And some people are going, oh, what about, what about me? But, you know, as long as we keep closing gaps, we'll get to that point where we can all be celebrated and all of us achieve the, the maximum of our energy. Vicky, was there anything we you want to add? We wouldn't have any days, <laughs> though. We'd have no morning teas because there'd be no need for days. So, I don't know. I think it's great. A great vision, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, he, we had um, we have a different. I guess we were like, across the department. We were already in a in a, a cultural state of change uh, when this was starting um, to be a discussion for us. Um, and so I think we, as a, you know, we were talking before. There's a real sweet spot that you know it just happened to fit into at the time. And we have a, a policy um, known as we all belong. And so it wasn't specific to um, disability. It wasn't specific to uh, any specific areas. It was about this idea that inclusion perhaps is a binary term of ex exclusion and inclusion. And so we wanted to sort of work with that a little bit. You know, we're education. We have fun with words. And so we, uh, we sort of talked more about this idea of we all belong. So there's a sense of belonging. So a sense of belonging for our students, for our families, a sense of belonging for us as staff, sense of belonging for all of everyone in our corporate teams as well. And so we really had a policy that wasn't necessarily um, um, something that uh, was a strategy, but it was, it was just a cultural um, piece that we were working on right across the department around belonging. Um, and certainly feeling a sense of belonging in the workplace was about being accepted uh, for whatever those uh, individual um, needs that you had or um, individual ways that you worked uh, and an acceptance of that. So um, I'm not too sure that it was that it was a strategy as such, but it was it's certainly a policy that has been embedded within the department um, and certainly words and, and phrases that we use that really talk about a sense of belonging for everybody in our community. Brilliant. Thank you Have so much. Have you guys much. seen the Brene Brown? Um, she's on YouTube, Brene Brown. She talks about belonging and it's the opposite of fitting in. And I think if you haven't seen that or if you want someone to connect to that concept of belonging, it's really touching. And I think it's where we all need to be. Fitting in takes so much energy and that's the mask we apply. But the belonging is a genuine sense that you fit in with that environment and it must be a wonderful feeling. <laughs> so yeah. She's, a, she's a brilliant presenter. That. We definitely oh, encourage amazing. Brene Brown. Yeah. 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 And that's speaks to why we haven't promoted the dandelion program because we want that belonging there's a, a question in the the q a and I, I encourage the person who wrote that if you can please reword it i'm having trouble uh passing it it starts with i'd like to understand what triggers autism to work please let me know if you're talking about a child at school or the workforce which tends to be adults and just if you could clarify your question i don't want to, to miss out on that but the, the next one is a really important one, and it's down to the nuts and bolts. It's about a business case and financial expectations for an organisation. We spoke about not being a charity. How did you help your organisation to see that this is a business value outcome as well as an employee value outcome? I think there's many parts to that too, because I think a lot of the things you can do as an organisation cost nothing. I mean, really having a bit of empathy and, and doing having some education. I mean, yes, you can pay external providers, but if you've got people or passionate, um, like like all of us within an agency, tap into them to spread the, the education, um, to destigmatise. Uh, de that costs very little, costs nothing. I think in terms of having to have some sort of a program, an autism at work program come in, yes, there's a price tag attached and that's where you need to understand the business need and what capability uplift that that, that money and that investment in our people will provide. But I think the other sales pitch to spending money on it is that the byproduct that you're going to get by what recruitment processes or recruitment teams can learn from looking at how um, these autism at work programs assess 
um, candidates to bring them in. I think that the traditional um, recruiting processes are not wonderful for anybody. So if we can look at assessment based processes and looking at skills as opposed to qualifications, that's a massive transition. Again, that's a byproduct of spending money on a capability uplift. And you could bring consultants in to do that, or you could learn from other people's experiences. Um, in the You can't buy cultural change, so that's got to be done organically. Um, I think it's really just working out if you need to spend money um, showing the value. Um, there's so many case studies of other government agencies, um, you know, Services Australia or the major banks or DSS Defence. They have lots of examples that you can uh, leverage to show that, you know, I think it was uh, ANZ had a 26% productivity for the team within six weeks and problem solving and innovation and, and how they're, they're um, if you run a lean process across it, you know, you're saving time, you're saving motion, you know, there's there's a lot of things I think you can use as as to let as for that business case. Um, but I think you can also start small and those things that cost nothing. So I think you you would map it out. What can we do now? What are the quick wins, medium long term goals and, and what is that financial cost? But I think once you explain that, they start to go, well, it is worth the investment. Um, and it ultimately comes down to our people and they're worth every cent because if you don't have happy, supported um, people who belong, you don't have work. You don't have objectives and KPIs mean nothing if the people aren't willing to do the work. So you need, yeah, it's an investment in your people. And and that was the same. Yes, we looked at the investment, but we looked at the investment of not just the capability uplift in the area, but what we can learn from uh, this experience and that's yeah how we can address our recruitment practices how we can address uh, the things in our culture um, our reasonable adjustments how we manage those um, educating our uh, supervisors um, around neurodiversity there was a lot that came with it and that, speaking around that investment is where um, yeah we got support thank you and Vicky yeah and I agree with both Stacey and Lauren. Um, that's the easy part about going third with these questions. I often get to just <laughs> agree uh, because actually what you're both saying is, is completely true. In fact, it can be a really um, a cost effective and, and very low cost um, injection into your organisation. Uh, initially, you might decide that you want to try and find some funds, but like us in the department, we actually didn't go looking to create new positions we wanted to know what existing positions were available um, and just looked at different ways to fill those positions with uh, highly qualified people who had the skills to do them. Uh, and we just went about it in a different way. And so that was really what we sold. We knew that there was a business case around the fact that we needed new small staff. We knew that there was a, a wonderful uh, employment and you know a lot of people out there who could do this job. How can we make sure that we are getting the very best candidates? And I don't know any, um, supervisor or manager who doesn't want the very best candidate in that role, who is going to stay in the role um, and uh, ensure that it's a, a sustainable product. So, um, you know, for us, it, it could actually be a really low cost um, injection into your business. So, yeah, although, yeah. you know, money's always a help. <laughs> a I'll, little I'll bit you of money. There, it's, there's, there's the free actions that you can do, which are just so simple. And then there are, there are the cost saving actions that you, you're offsetting against in terms of attrition, absenteeism and lost productivity from people who are trying to mask or, or do all sorts of other things to cope in a workplace that is foreign and antagonistic towards their brain. And none of us want that. So there is, these are the things that we, we help to achieve a cost outcome. Can I, can I throw in one more stat? Because you know I love stats. Um, and I, I've, I'm not sure exactly where I read it, but I want to say it was in the ABS uh, on their website, but for every 30, it was for every, no, it might've been 10, 10 or 30. Anyway, I'm gonna be very vague on the stat, but the, the point is that it was for every 10 um, people, autistic people put into an autism at work program, it was saving the government um, you know, millions of dollars a year through the NDIS. So I think there's also, you might look at the savings and cost savings within your own agency, but for us, obviously it's a Commonwealth government agency, we're looking at the flow on effect of alleviating you know, the cost to the NDIS because these people are coming into employment, they're being supported, they're being, um, they're staying in that employment if we're doing things well for them and then they're paying taxes back into the system. So I think 
you know, there's so many different things you could look at to really have a business case around why this is important over and above just what it does for you and your capabilities. All right, and we've got an update to that uh, question a bit earlier. And there's also, I think it ties in with another question that's just come through as well. So it's about a person who is neurodivergent themselves and knowing when there is a threshold that they need to ask for support. When, when does the neurodivergence become to a, to a point where I'm, I'm really not fitting in? I can mask so much, but I need to then ask for help. And it's about negotiating those, those reasonable accommodations at work or even in a school environment, Vicky, I think as well. And how that, or how they can do that when many employers and managers still don't have the, the skills to have that conversation yet. Is, was, is there advice you can give in that context? That, that's a really tough question and it's quite personal. But for me, I would say it comes down to when you need it. Um, and I would think that as soon as you identify that you need it, you'd want to have that conversation early. Um, potentially, if your manager has no awareness or no experience with neurodiversity, that you might want to go into a, a meeting and, and talk about it and explain what it really is or if you have someone in the organisation, if you have an all abilities network or a neurodiversity champion, whoever it is, see if they might like to come with you to support you in having that conversation. I'd be looking at your agency's policy and around reasonable adjustments. Um, if there is a diagnosis, then there's protections on the Disability Discrimination Act around reasonable adjustments. Hopefully you wouldn't have to ever use that because I think most workplaces are genuinely want to support their staff and say, I, I need this and this is why I need it. And it comes back to that, um, equity versus equality, you know, it's about leveling that playing field. If someone needs it, they need it to do their job and to thrive. It's not about being special and put a higher above everyone else, but but yeah, have that conversation early. Yeah, the same. I agree with everything um, Lauren just said. Um, yeah, and, and I think, you know, you don't necessarily need to disclose to ask for a reasonable adjustment. I would like to see managers ask all their employees, how can I best make, make how, how can I support you to be your best at work? And asking that question to everyone gives that opportunity to say, well, I actually work best in this style or um, in this way. So that's on that. <laughs> Yeah. And Vicky? Yeah, look, I agree with both of those comments. I think that um, certainly we need to be offering all of our employees the opportunity to share when perhaps they need um, different, you know, supports across the day or across their working life. Um, specifically, though, within our program, we have identified um, different areas that we need to upskill managers in how to have those conversations um, openly with, with people so that they feel uh, supported about being able to say that they need a break or that, that they need support. Uh, but also we've provided specific mentors so that if they if the employee didn't want to disclose that they, that they were um, perhaps um, uh, needing extra support to their manager for many reasons, uh, then they were able to then contact someone else within our team who was able to support them at that time. Um, and so there were different avenues, not just one person that they could go to for support um, during the time. So, yeah, a few different right. opportunities. Thank you so much. I, I can see Orion is looking at his watch at the moment, so I'm in a bit of trouble. There's a final comment here, and I think it should be should be addressed, is uh, in, in terms of this is just good management, isn't it? You know, why is it different for a uh, neurotypical person? person versus neurodivergent and absolutely 100% agree with that and I think what we've just heard here is that these amazing women are allies and champions within their organization and they put themselves out there which means somebody else within that organization can say I'm having a hard time can you help me with my situation or I can go to HR or I can do these things and that is the value of having an ally having a champion within within your organization and the value that that you can bring, but it is just good management to simply talk to your employees and say, how are you going? Is there more I can yeah. do? How can I help? Yeah. Thank you, Orion. And thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Vicky. Thanks, Lauren. Thanks, Stacy. Thank you all. We, uh, we appreciate your time and your insights. Some, some great thoughts and things there. Uh, many, many things popped into my head as, as we were going there. I think, you know, th there's important things to to remember through these discussions and uh well i mean we we just simply have no time to talk about them so i think that's um that's a good 
a good thing for everyone involved uh, that I don't have to bring up some thoughts and ideas. Um, all right, that's the end of the session. Uh, let's head off, uh, get some feedback too. If you'd like to take a minute, complete the session feedback form. You can access that at the tab on the right. We're having a lunch break now. So enjoy your lunch break. Our next session is the workshop on how to make an autism at work program sustainable. So a continuation of our two-part workshop program. To get there, you'll click on the homepage and the agenda page to go back to where you started. And at one o'clock, obviously, when the session starts, you'll have that link there. You can click on that and you'll be ready to go. Enjoy your lunch break and we'll see you very soon. The 2023 Autism at Work Virtual Summit was proudly sponsored by DXC Technologies, GHT Engineering, La Trobe University, Untapped Group, ANZ, and SAP. Autism CRC is the independent national source of evidence for best practice. For more information on Autism CRC or the Autism at Work Virtual Summit, head to our website, autismcrc.com.au.